Good morning, good morning. Welcome, welcome. Back into our study uh, for Mondays and Tuesdays on Judges. And let's start with a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, oh Lord, thank you, Lord, so much for the for your word and for all you give us to help us to understand your word and help me to be ever honorable to your word and uh, that everything I say and do is honoring to you. In Jesus' precious name I pray, amen. Okay, part three today. Still in chapter one, I finish it off today. And uh, I think that the, the tribes feel in taking full possession of their land. As we saw last time when we were talking about uh, some of the other areas, uh, Judea and, uh, and Simeon, that uh, now we're going to move on to Benjamin, Ephraim, and Manasseh in that general area, and Dan's included, uh, about the fact that they are, are not uh, are not following what God's ultimate plan was for them. And uh, we get some verses going here. I've got the, actually, I forgot to bring up the program. So let me get that real quick. Okay. So we're starting off in verse 21 today. Not much of an opening here. We're just continuing on uh, in chapter 21 here. And, and uh, it's kind of like a setup. This is kind of like a, a transition from Joshua. Uh, Joshua, of course, <coughs> we left off there. And now we're moving into Judges. And the fact is, is that uh, everything Joshua said, uh, at first it's the, it looks like, you know, some of the tribes are going to start out looking pretty good. And we're going to see that today. But other tribes, I uh, guess, were not successful. They weren't relying on the Lord as much as they should have. And that's a, that's the key <coughs> all through Judges that we're going to see. So let's just pick right up here in verse 21. We left at verse 20 yesterday, uh, last week. And the children of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites that inhabited Jerusalem. But the Jebusites dwell with the children of Benjamin in Jerusalem until this day. And we got, I got a little map here just to, so we can keep in perspective what we're talking about here. And so the uh, today what we're talking about here is right here in Benjamin, because Jebu J E B B U S. That's that's Jerusalem right there in the middle. Uh, if you can see it, it actually is in Benjamin. As we're going to find out later on, Judah is a very helpful. And helping Benjamin uh, originally secure, uh, last time we talked about, and securing uh, Jerusalem. And they actually burned the city to the ground, if you remember correctly. But the, but the people that uh, weren't completely successful in driving all the people out of their area so that they can have it all to themselves. So they, they own the property, but there's still people there uh, from the former uh, idolatry uh, idolatry tribes. So with the battle already won, which I, I if you remember, uh, back in uh, Judges 1.8 is when that happened. Let me just go back there really quick and uh, show you where where that was done. Now the children of Judah had fought against Jerusalem and had taken it and smitten it with the edge of the sword and set the city on fire. So that's that's the last thing we have here. But the tribe of Benjamin simply had to enter into it what was already theirs. It would eagerly, it would certainly take effort, but the, the, the critical part of the battle was over. Jerusalem belonged to them. But the Jebusites dwell with the children of Benjamin in Jerusalem until this day. Realize that uh, the, the book of Judges was actually written after. Most people think that it was Samuel that wrote it. Uh, we don't know for sure who wrote Judges. But it was actually, so all this all this information is being relayed to the writer at a later date. So that's why you'll see this a lot in, the, in, in here. That term, until this day, at the end there. So it just means that... Uh, we're looking back in history, and that uh, they're reflecting on the fact 
that even up to the point of time that they're actually doing the writing of judges, that the, uh, the Jebusites were still there. So you can see they weren't successful in driving them out. The tribe of Benjamin failed to cast out the Jebusites and therefore lived in constant military and spiritual uh, danger. So again, moving on uh, to the next group, verses 20 through 26. Now we're going to see that uh, we're going to go up, up north here a little bit more. And if you remember, Joseph's two sons were Manasseh and Ephraim. And they are separate tribes, uh, and that uh, because of the uh, adoption by Jacob, uh, that they became actual sons of Jacob by adoption also. So they got an actual inheritance. So sometimes you'll see Joseph mentioned, all the times you'll see Manasseh and Ephraim uh, replace, uh, replace Joseph. So it's interesting here, we're going to see that the house of, it's going to mention the house of Joseph. And the house of Joseph, they also went up against Bethel, and the Lord was with them. Well, Bethel, you see it's right there. And the house of Joseph sent to discry, discry Bethel. Now the name of the city before was Lutz. And the spies saw a man come forth out of the city, and they said unto him, Show us, we pray thee, the entrance into the city, and we will show thee mercy. They're going to take something out of Joshua's handbook here when he took over Jericho. We're going to see. Verse 25. And when he showed them the entrance into the city, they smote the city with the edge of the sword, but they let let go the man and all his family. Well, it's interesting that man that family is going to show back up years later. Verse twenty six. And the man went into the land of the Hittites and built the city and called the name thereof Lutz, which is the name thereof unto this day. So the house of Joseph. This is interesting and somewhat rare. Combining uh, of the two tribes that came from Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh, into one group, the house of Joseph. We saw there in verse 22, and the Lord was with them. We might we may credit this victory to the, the effort, the effort of the use of military espionage. They actually got uh, got a spy to help them out in finding out what, a little bit about the city. But the real reason was because the Lord was with them, and that's an important thing. The the, the ultimate goal was the fact the Lord was with them. They were lying, and they knew that. So it sounds like that they had uh, prior uh, knowledge. They had approached the Lord about helping them. Going back to this idea that prayer, prayer, and uh, and bringing and and including the Lord in everything we do is a is a definite plus. And also, we noticed in verse twenty four, and the spies saw a man come forth out of the city, and they said unto him, Show us the, we pray thee, the entrance into the city, and we will show thee mercy. But they let the man and all his family go. They seem to use the events surrounding Rahab and the conquering of Jericho as a pattern. We actually saw this in Joshua 2, 12 and 13. Now therefore I pray ye, pray, now therefore I pray you, swear unto me by the Lord, since I have showed you kindness. This is Rahab talking to the uh, Joshua's troops. That you will show us that ye will also show kindness unto my father's house and give me a true token and that ye will save alive my father and my mother and my brethren and my sisters and all that I have and deliver our lives from death so it seems that the, uh, the uh, house of Joseph here had remembered what died and used a similar thing David did a very similar thing too also in 1 Samuel 30 15 and David said to him Canst thou bring me down to this company? And he said, Swear unto me by God that thou wilt neither kill me nor deliver me into the hands of my master, and I will bring thee down to this company. So David and, and uh, had uh, used somebody else to help him in warfare. So I love it when we see patterns in the Bible. Uh, for me, that proves the divine author of the Bible, the fact that uh, we see these same patterns uh, repeated. By different by different people, uh, so it kind of shows a timeline. It shows that uh, these uh, these uh, these things were were not uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for. Basically, it's a pattern uh, that uh, you'll see that same patterns used over and over again. So 
So in this particular case, uh, the house of Joseph was successful in taking Bethel, and they let that person go. Uh, that uh, it was interesting. We're going to see that uh, that family come back because notice there it said that uh, they went into the house, and the man went into the land of the Hittites and built a city, and called the name thereof Lutz, which is the name thereof unto this day. So this particular family was a uh, this particular area in Bethel was uh, was actually controlled by the Hittites, and the man who had helped out the uh, to helped out uh, Manasseh and Ephraim actually went to another area where the Hittites were located. We're going to see that come back to haunt them later. Actually, okay. Next section, verse twenty-seven through twenty-nine. So Manasseh and Ephraim uh, were, were successful in Bethel, but maybe they got a little proud, maybe they got a little bit uh, carried away, but uh, Manasseh and Ephraim failed to drive out all the Canaanites. We're going to see this in, uh, in this next section, verses 27 through 29. Neither did Manasseh drive out the inhabitants of Bashin and her towns, uh, nor Tanech and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Dor and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Ibim, and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Megiddo and her towns, but the Canaanites would dwell in that land. And it came to pass when Israel was strong that they put the Canaanites to tribute and did not utterly drive them out. So, but the Canaanites would dwell in the land, I mentioned there. I can see that the, the thought of having tributes was a, was a wordly draw to the Canaanites under tribute. Tribute basically means that they, uh, for for not taking for not killing them that they had to basically serve uh, the uh, the Ephraim, uh, Ephraim and Manasseh uh, so that they wouldn't get killed but that still means they're still there and they're not dead and so that the influences I like somebody I once heard is that uh, if you think you're going to be able to change someone's uh, like I've heard this before particularly in uh, uh, Friendship. Let's say you have a friend who uh, is a, uh, oh, a, a agnostic, uh, an atheist, and you're a Christian, and you think that you're going to be able to change him. Well, most is a good chance. There's a chance that you that's going to be the other way around, where he's going to change you. Uh, so be careful about uh, what they call it being unequally yoked. And the same situation here is that they're allowing the Canaanites to uh, serve them, but. Uh, what's interesting is over time that that can actually come back to, to become a curse. So they did not utterly drive them out. In the same way, when someone first begin, begins their Christian life, they may not be strong enough in the Lord to uh, to deal with all the things that they see that need that need changing. Yet as they grow in the Lord, that that uh, they must uh, not slack in dealing with those areas. We never are to make a peace treaty with our sins. Instead, be determined to drive them out. Uh, Meyer, uh, theologian Meyer says this. The one point that Israel should have bore in mind was that they had no right there. The land was not theirs. It had become Israel's. And moreover, God was prepared to drive them out so that his people would not have no fighting to do, but only to chase a flying foe. And we're going to find out that Gezer didn't belong to Israel until it was given to Solomon by Pharaoh. So that, uh, that there's a town there that Gezer ended up uh, being uh, in control of the Canaanites well until, uh, away until Pharaoh, uh, I mean Solomon. There's that verse there. Uh, Neither did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites to dwell in Gezer, but the Canaanites dwelt in Gezer among them. And uh, believe it or not, it was uh, many, uh, oh gosh, over a thousand years later in Solomon before they actually drove them out. And that was in 1 Kings 9.16. For Pharaoh, king of Egypt, had gone up and taken Gezer and burned it with fire and slain the Canaanites to dwell in that city and gave it for a present unto his daughter, Solomon's wife. So you can see that uh, that because they didn't drive them out, that they actually became a uh, a force again in that area, and it actually uh, and they multiplied to the point where uh, it became a Canaanite city again. So 
sorry, but I wanted about it. We can see that uh, the, the same thing is happening again, is that God wanted them driven out. And uh, there's a lot of speculation as to why. I have my theories uh, that has to do with this, uh, with Satan. Satan is always trying to hit us at our weak points. And, uh, and these particular people, their weak point is the fact that they have a tendency to uh, want to go back to what they remember in idol worship. And God's been trying to break them of that. Okay, verse 30 is the next one. Now we're going to talk about the tribe of Zebulun. Neither did Zebulun drive out the inhabitants of Kitron, nor the inhabitants of Nahol, but the Canaanites dwelt among them and became tributaries. Now here we go, here we do again, tributes. So now we're talking about Zebulun. Zebulun's a little bit, uh, where is Zebulun? It's up here in the Sea of Galilee. This is the area that uh, ultimately become where Jesus comes from. That's actually a prophecy too. So nor did Zebulun drive out the inhabitants. Each tribe had its own responsibility and its own battles to fight. But the Canaanites dwelt among them and became tributaries. The people of Zebulun thought that they could make their incomplete obedience work to their advantage, especially economically. They failed to appreciate that Canaanites who dwelt among them would eventually bring them into both social and spiritual crisis. I'm reminded of the thought that we can change someone else like in marriage, but like Solomon found out, typically it's the other way around. Solomon had, had this tendency to, to multiply wives. He had over a thousand of them. And, and I think a lot of them were actually gifts from other, uh, he kept making deals with other kings uh, around the area to keep the peace. But in doing so, those kings felt obligated to give gifts. In that time frame, it was not unusual for one king to give another king a gift of a wife. Uh, and that's how I think how Solomon ended up with so many wives. Because the crisis was not immediate, it was easy to think that it was not real. Yes, it was certain, and only a trusting obedience to God could spare them the later cycle of crisis that marks the book of Judges. It was, we're going we're to find out that uh, this is the ongoing issue all through Judges. Is that they, they just didn't realize what, uh, what they were doing and what it was going to cost them later. Okay, continuing on, verse 31 and 32. Now we're going to talk about Asher. And where is Asher? Asher is up here on the seacoast. Tyre, uh, famous Tyre. Well, that's short in uh, biblical history a lot. Neither did Asher drive out the inhabitants of Echo, nor the inhabitants of Zidon, nor of uh, Alab, nor of uh, Akzib, nor of Helba, nor of Ethnic, nor of Rehob. They really didn't drive a lot of people out. But the Ashenites dwelt among the Canaanites and the inhabitants of the land, for they did not drive them out. Neither did Asher, the tribe of Asher, also failed to take what God had appointed for them. Each tribe who failed made it easier for the other tribes to also fail. The Ashenites dwelt among the Canaanites. Of the people of Zebulun, we read that the Canaanites dwelt among them. We saw that in verse 30. Yet in Asher, it was even worse. It was the Ashenites who dwelt among the Canaanites. They suffered a worse degree of social and spiritual uh, declension. Crindle, the theologian Crindle actually states, uh, whilst most of the tribes were able to occupy at least some part of their allotted territory, the tribe of Asher seems to have completely failed completely to dislodge the Canaanites. And continuing on, verse 33. Neither did Naphtali, right there next door to Asher. Maybe because Asher was unsuccessful, Naphtali was also unsuccessful because they were, uh, they could see that uh, Asher, what Asher was doing. Neither did Naphtali drive out the inhabitants of uh, Beth Shemesh, uh, nor the inhabitants of Beth Anath, but he dwelt among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land, nevertheless, the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh of, and of uh, Bethlehemeth became tributaries unto them. So neither did Naphtali drive out the inhabitants. The tribe of Naphtali found it difficult to counter the trend of the other tribes. The defeat of one affects the conditions of the others. So God never intended for Israel to conquer the land of Canaan easily. He never intended it to happen even, even quickly. 
if you remember all the way back in Exodus, the original uh, command had stated that God was going to allow them to get the land as they grew, so that uh, the land wouldn't be uh, wouldn't get destroyed and overrun with animals. And we see that back in Exodus 23, 29, and 30. I will I will not drive them out from before thee in one year, lest the land become desolate and the beasts of the field multiply against thee. But little by and little I will drive them out from before thee until thou be increased and inherit the land. We can see here that they are ready to inherit the land. They didn't drive them out as they were told to do. It's also mentioned in Deuteronomy 7, 22 through 24. And the Lord thy God will put out those nations before thee by little and little. Thou mayest not consume them at once, lest the beasts of the field increase upon thee. But the Lord thy God shall deliver them unto thee and shall destroy them with a mighty destruction until they be destroyed. And he shall deliver their kings into thine hand and thou shalt destroy their name from under heaven. There shall no man be able to stand before thee until thou have destroyed them. This is the part they were not following. God wanted them completely destroyed uh, when the time was right. And they weren't doing that. Both say that God intended to give them the land little by little. Though God planned for Israel to take the land through constant trust in him and frequent battles, they failed to do this and therefore did not drive out the inhabitants. It was almost as if Israel said, if we can't have it easy, then we, won't, we don't want it at all. They weren't willing to work for it. And also mentioned, but he dwelt among the Canaanites. Nevertheless, the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh and Beth Anith were both put under tribute to them. The people of Naphtali combined both facets of uh, competition to the enemy. In some regions of their territory, they lived under the shadow I missed a page. <laughs> oh, it's on the printer. <laughs> of the dominating Canaanites. In other regions, they put the Canaanites under tribute to them. Both facets fell well short of God's command and intent for the people of Israel. Now, it's a whole... I've already done a bunch of studies as to why I believe that God needed them all eliminated back when we talked about uh, the giants and these and the uh, the offspring uh, from the uh, uh, from uh, Genesis six, uh, what they call the uh, the Nephilim. And I think that's why God needed them all removed completely because of they they uh, they had become corrupt seeds and they were going to cause problems ultimately with the birth of Jesus Christ. And this was how Satan was going to get to them. So. It, Satan is still working here by allowing them to live and continue on. And God has said, if you didn't drive them out, that he was going to, he was going to stop helping you. Okay, continuing on in 34 and 30 through 36. Now we got the tribe of Dan. Dan's in two places. We got Dan there and also Dan down here. We know they took that area pretty quickly. So I think the Dan we're talking about in this pa passage is the one down here. Now the Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountain, for they would not suffer them to come down to the valley. But the Amorites would dwell in the Mount Herez and Ad Adajalon and in Shab Shabim, yet the hand of the house of Joseph prevailed so that they became tributaries. Remember that uh, the Amorite, that Ephraim and Manasseh were successful the, against the Amorites. So that actually helped Dan. And the coast of the Amorites was from the going up to uh, Akarabim, from the rock and upward. So the Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountains. Here we see the people of, Ga of God being pushed around by their enemies. This should never be the case when God's people are walking in the strength of God. Yet the hand of the house of Joseph prevailed so that they became tributaries. Again, instead of doing what God said, 
should be done with these enemies to completely drive them out. They decided to use them as they, as they thought best to put their enemies under tribute, basically slavery. Uh, <coughs> Trapp says this, that this they did out of covetousness, the root of all evil, neglecting the command of God to the contrary. They thought, yeah, let's just use them as uh, basically as slaves. And the coast of the Amorites, the end result was that the Amorites had an appointed boundary within the inheritance of God's people. This was an unnecessary and dangerous accommodation to the social and spiritual uh, enemies of the people of God. There is a dangerous and seductive form of uh, pacifism in the Christian life, which ignores the reality of spiritual battle, uh, so clearly described in Ephesians 6. And I think that, that Ephesians 6, 10 through 20 really spells it out as to what, what we got to be ever mindful of when we, when we compromise. Let's look at this passage uh, from Paul. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, and you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shot with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all power and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that there, therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. So, clearly described in this passage and referred to by an analogy in the book of Judges, the pacifist attitude would happily make a peace with the devil then basically says, I will not harm your interest if you leave me mostly alone. This attitude of spiritual surrender is unacceptable for the Christian. Leon Trotsky, the infamous communist leader, said at, le at least one correct thing. You may not be interested in war, but war is interested in you. To take an attitude of spiritual surrender is to willingly lose the war. At this time, at this period of time, the tributes, the tribes of Israel at, at their best experienced incomplete victory. At their worst, they simply surrendered to and accommodated the enemy. This makes us value the complete and uh, glorious victory of Jesus Christ on our behalf all the more. There was nothing left incomplete in the victory he won for for us on the cross and through the resurrection. So now I want to move into chapter 2 just briefly. Let's see how we're doing on time. Uh, I think I'll stop here. I'll just read what we're going to talk about tomorrow. The Judges 2, 1 through 5. And the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bacham, and said, I made you to go out of Egypt, and have brought you unto the land which I swear unto your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And you shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land. You shall throw down their altars. But you have not obeyed my voice. What have you done? Why have you done this? Wherefore, I also said, I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be as thorns in your side, and their gods shall be a snare unto you. And it came to pass when the angel of the Lord spake these words unto all the children of Israel, that the people lifted up their voice and wept. And they called the name of the place Bacham, and they sacrificed there unto the Lord. A little bit too little too late, most likely, because uh, we'll study that more tomorrow. I want to talk about the fact that who is this angel of the Lord and... Uh, so we'll end there for right now. Dear Heavenly Father, oh Lord, thank you. Thank you so much for this up, uh, this word and this 
that we really, really need to uh, choose our battles and, and be wise as, uh, as you instruct us as what we should do. And that uh, your word is not as, as true today as it was then. That we need to look to your word for the guidance we need in all matters. And we need to stick to them. And we know that life will be better if we do. And we thank you and give you praise for your word and for the opportunities you present for us. Uh, I praise you and thank you so much. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, so we'll pick this back up tomorrow and, and start off here in Judges 2.1. Uh, but that... Uh, Basically, they're not following God's commandments. So God is going to send an angel of the Lord, which actually is uh, Jesus Christ incarnate. And we'll talk about that a little bit tomorrow uh, again. Uh, we mentioned that uh, you know, the famous time of the burning bush uh, was, a, was another time. And so that, uh, he's actually going to come in person and speak to them and try to, and try to get them back on track. We're going to see how that goes. Uh, and we'll talk about that tomorrow. So have a great day. and. See you tomorrow.